Uh, Ruth, I would love it if you would take it away and thank you so much for being our presenter today. Okay, thank you, Chris, for asking me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Ruth Pfeffer here. I don't see all of you, but I know you can hear me. And without further ado, we will get on with the show. I had fun putting this together. Um, I would like nothing better than talk about birds and, and plants and pollinators. So uh, black-eyed Susie's are one of, uh, I think, everybody's favorite um, uh, photos. Well, this is one of my favorite photos, favorite flowers. And, uh, and lots of birds uh, come and enjoy them without further. And a uh, morning cloak butterfly, uh, because really when you plant for birds, you automatically plant, plant for butterflies too. Although there are plants that we're gonna make available to you and list that I had sent to Chris. But this is a morning cloak. And the reason we see the morning cloak butterfly in March is because they're laying their eggs right now on the plants that are in your yard. All right, and there's one of our pollinators. That is a dog vane beetle, and it is on a dog vane plant that looks really like milkweed. Um, the beetle spends most of his time on his and her time on dog vane, but it's interesting um, he's been with us so long, he precedes bees and butterflies. So uh, a beetle's pollinated a lot of the ancient plants. So he pollinates magnolias and spice bushes for a couple ones because they're plants that have been with us a long time. And there are the birds, uh, birds, rose-breasted rose grosbeak uh, at the feeder and one of our migratory birds and migratory birds are going through now. All right, and there he is, another one. One time I had eight of them on that hopper feeder. Uh, beautiful, beautiful bird, heading down to Central America, that bird is. Now I wanted to point out that um, the male and females look different. This is the, the male, the rose-breasted grosbeak with a pretty robin song, not singing now, and that's the female. He looks really different and they give the sound of a squeaky gate, which they're not doing that now because in the fall, the birds aren't singing their love songs. And that's what a first year male looks like at a feeder. So sometimes bird ID can be a little um, difficult. And uh, when you're enjoying the birds, it's nice to have a field guide and even binoculars when you're learning them and just make a list. Uh, when we plant our yards for birds, uh, we of course uh, get uh, occipiters, because uh, occipiter is the sharp shin hawk and the cooper's hawk. Um, this is my first digital photo I ever took. I put my lens on, came down stairs, and this bird was looking at me. All these pictures are through the kitchen window, by the way. I am not out in my yard. I have a nice button on my photo that takes the pane, window pane out. Um, and of course, they come. And now, sharp shins and, and um, sharp shin and cooper hawks are up in numbers because we have been feeding birds and they come to our yard. So it has helped them increase in numbers. They're not as stressed trying migrating as far. And that's the sharp shin um, uh, adult with the square tail. The cooper's has the round tail. And come, it's coming into fall. And this is what our wonderful bright yellow bird starts to look at like. And this bird likes thistle. And it not only eats thistle, but um, it waits for the thistle plant um, to grow its little fiber material. That's what it, um, it uses in its nest. But right now they're turning into their fall cut plumage. Uh, in the spring, the indigo bunting, which is traveling through now on its way down to Central America. Our yards are super important to our migratory birds and our residents. So there you have a resident bird, the gold, American goldfinch on, well, on my right, and um, the indigo bunting. And sometimes I will get four or five indigo buntings in my yard at one time. And uh, they, they, they like thistle also. The goldfinch will switch to black oil seed in about a month, by the way. Uh, and there's another picture of the, the female or, um, turning for its winter and the male on the thistle plant. That's what they like. Woodpeckers that come, um, I, uh, in my yard, I have suet for the woodpeckers. This is a hairy, and they're hairy young that were born, I'm sure, crossed in the woods. If you don't have a peanut feeder, get one, because, uh, I mean, many species of birds really enjoy the peanuts, and there's the suet. And there's a downy woodpecker, 
uh, and the downy from, you can tell the downy from the hairy, the downy has no black spots on its white outer tail feathers, plus the bill is smaller. And the red belly woodpecker, beautiful, beautiful bird. So you get them. Well, now let's get on to our plants. This is a story. This is a native plant. I bought several of them. However, I never got them in my, on, in my feeder, my, my planters that are on my railing, because that is a fledgling gray catbird that nests in my yard. All right. And they were picking out the blossoms from the plant. And let me show you. Every morning and every afternoon, these birds, they were picking the blooms off the flowers and the leaves that were turning brown. So I never got them in. But they also did, I have a great egret that's made out of recycled material. And there's the fledgling on the bill. So if, at whatever you put in your yard, birds will land on. So be careful what you do that, because they can get hurt from something, anything. And I have other pictures. So that's the fledgling gray catbird. And the plants never got in the, the big pot that I wanted to get them in. And I've seen this behavior other places. Here's the gray cat bird picking up the blossoms. I think of a tulip poplar plant. And it, I, I watched it for 20 minutes and it just picked it up, whether it's for the moisture, whether there's mites in there. I'm really not sure about the behavior, but I've seen other birds do that, that behavior also. And there is, I have a friendship, friendship fly catch, um, a sun catcher, and that's a house wren that landed on it. Uh, as, and that's just, uh, that's just sticking up in a planter that's on the railing. Now, let's talk about our potted plants. I let my plants go to seed. The reason that Santa Claus is sitting there, um, because one year we had a big storm and we had to throw our tree out um, the front door <laughs> because we couldn't get out the back, and that got stuck on the tree, so it stayed in the yard. But there's a downy woodpecker. It's so important to leave your pot plants in the pot because there's seed, there's nutrients in there. And um, like for instance, in my herb plants, uh, every bird in my yard goes into that uh, planter to do it. When I am dumping the soil, I put it all in one spot because all the birds will come, uh, especially in the winter time. That'll be the source of their getting their getting some food. And um, that was the planter, by the way, that my, um, the native plants are going in. That's a robin on the railing. And you can see I'm close, I have a small yard, but I have the street, I have woods in the field across the street. Uh, and um, food, shelter, and water. That's what the birds are coming for. Not all birds that come to your yard go to feeders, they go to our plants. Um, and um, you have plants and you plant your yard, so there is, um, some shelter. This is one of my three bird baths and a nice little uh, baby robin was taken um, a nice little bath and I got its picture. That's a white throated sparrow. I have three different things in this bird bath because just like us, birds are different sizes. And that's a white throated sparrow and I let the vegetation around my deck get a little higher and um, that some of the birds now come closer and get in the bird bath or actually come to my glass table that's out there also um, because shelter is super important. So I have the shell, a rock, and sometimes there's three or four different species in the bird bath, but they enjoy that. A Carolina wren investigating. So I went out afterwards and look at those. You can tell Carolina wren likes to be on the ground and forage by those big toenails and feet, uh, but he will go on the suet and uh, and um, he was going after, he was eating bodies out of a little spider web that left some food. May all your squirrels be like this statue in your yard, when you are. And uh, Northern Flicker landed on the deck. And I think when you have the vegetation around and it's friendly, the birds get closer to you also. So here we go, uh, honeysuckle. This is, this is native honeysuckle. It is one of my favorite plants. It is so wonderful. I have hummingbirds all summer now. And um, I should say, because I have pictures of a lot of other ones, the, the, uh, the shrubs that I have are, um, a few of the shrubs are winterberry. I have cranberry by Burnham. I have mountain laurel. And all of them produce flowers, uh, you know, at different times of the year. So they're the shrubs. I'm going to concentrate on flowers because uh, we're getting ready for this big plant sale at Pennypack on Saturday. 
And there's another picture of that wonderful ruby-throated hummingbird. It's on its way down to Central America. They fly across the Gulf of Mexico nonstop. It's absolutely amazing. And put something in the yard and the hummingbird, that's why you're keeping um, the beans together, the honeysuckles on. And uh, she will not let, she'll stake the whole plant out, will not let another male or female touch any of the nectar in those flowers. That's it. Well, um, two years ago, I was surprised. Scarlet tanager, which is a woodland bird, uh, and two of them were at my bird feeder when I got up in the morning and came down. Uh, that's what the male looks like. And again, um, not all birds are going to go to your feeders, but they're coming for the vegetation that's in your yard. These are woodland birds. They're on their way down to Central America also. And uh, I've had them whose birds aren't necessarily using the same kind of habitat that they nest in. And uh, that's a new thing learned in the last 50 years. And this is what the bird looks like when it's a young male. So let me go back. There's the female, there's the male, and this is what it looks like now in the fall, a young male. First time I saw one, I really had to, because it can have a lot more yellow and green on it too. Well, my son had wild bird oasis in New Jersey for a number of years, and this is one of his displays. All the plants are native. He was a distributor of native plant of native plants, and um, and going to talk more about that. But these are some of the kind of feeders um, that you can get. There's a wider uh, range of all different kinds, according to how much room. And all of our properties are different, which I'm going to talk about that. Well, flies. This is a little fly, but it's a, it's a bee mimic. It's mimicking a bee. And this is one of our pollinators, because we all know that bees are the largest of our pollinators uh, for numbers. However, flies are the second. There's a lot of wasps also. And so I did put a, a, a few of the cute flies in. We always think of the house fly, but there are some, and I think he's a cute little uh, uh, critter there, all right? And what you have natural in your yard, I encourage that. We do not have a manicured property. I, leave, I use, leave leaves, I owe a big area that um, eroded, um, you know, from tree roots, and I have wonderful moss growing around it. You can't buy moss prettier than what it is in natural, that's for sure. And I put this in, uh, Chris especially, uh, she did a laugh at it. I, this is the Halloween spider, and uh, I have seen this at Penny Pack. So I put it in because Halloween's coming. So happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, and it really, the web is just, it's just like, like an, uh, an umbrella. It's amazing. And uh, I think it actually hops that spider. Don't get too close to it. Uh, cone flowers, want, right? It's just beautiful to have cone fly, flowers. And of course, they have wonderful nectar. And that's the great spangled frivolary uh, and that's feeding on it right now. And uh, I wanted to mention monarchs because they're super important. And of course, like at the trust, in all of their wonderful fields with the native plants, they have lots of milkweed. And, um, and I know that milkweed's going to be available, you know, at the sale. But these are, this is the only picture I have of mating monarch butterflies. It's the only time I saw them mate. So I'm going to do, and then I saw the female, right not after this mating, just a couple of days later, that is a little monarch egg on the back of the milkweed plant. This is why it's so important because um, definitely monarchs are down in numbers. So for those of us who have the yard to, where milkweed can grow, it's really important. There's the caterpillar, of course, the chrysalis, and then there's the end result. And um, any of you that have properties, I highly suggest that you plant uh, milkweed. It's beautiful to look at, uh, and it's very beneficial to birds and butterflies. And zinnia. Zinnias are a flower that's been around for a long time and, of course, grows on many continents. But I love that contrast of the monarch butterfly on the zinnia plant. And uh, a tiger swallowtail, uh, just really enjoying that nectar. I took this photo down Cape May, but I wanted to show it to you because this is how the cluster of monarchs benefiting from places like Pennypack and our properties. And they um, are at Cape May primarily feeding on goldenrod. Chris and I talked about goldenrod yesterday. I know that that's one of the plants 
um, that Penny Pack has. Um, and I thought you'd appreciate just the sheer numbers to be down there when that happens. It's such a treat. There were thousands of them in front of me, but I love this photo. So a plant for uh, monarchs too. Uh, we get migrants in the yard and sometimes they hang around. This is the yellow rum warbler. I took this picture last year, November 26th. It should have been gone by at least October 15th or something like that. But again, climate change is happening. And this is the marathoner of all the warblers. He goes the farthest from Central America all the way up to the boreal forest. So he goes up north and goes west. Um, and they're being studied. That's why they're called the marathoners um, because they go farther, even though other warblers are with them, they still fly farther for their, wind, for their uh, nesting grounds. White throat sparrows will be arriving um, next month. All right, and they will enjoy our yards and, and the shelter that's provided. Another fly is the snipe fly, the golden back snipe fly. I've only seen it three times and all three times they were nesting. All right, uh, they were nesting, not nesting, they were mating, sorry. And the plant that they, um, one of the plants that they pollinate are viburnums. So I found that interesting. Here's that. Here's the wasp I told you about. This is the golden um, uh, digger wasp, all right? The great golden digger wasp. Now it's very, it's not aggressive. And if you don't use pesticides in your yard, that's the inviting quality that this wasp has. And guess what it, it will do? It will eat the aphids and grasshoppers and other insects that would be injurious to other plants that you have. And they're not aggressive, and um, so it, they're a very nice um, wasp, a very nice insect to have in your yard. The hummingbird moth uh, is really another one of our helpers uh, in our yard, and really um, a fun to watch. Uh, New York aster, I think it's one of the prettiest flowers, no matter where you see it, it's beautiful. And there are another zinnia, uh, which just grabs at you. The flowers. Um, and, and the plants, the native plants are so important because there you have the birds. Of course, the pollinators are important and the birds, but the birds are the biggest seed dispersers. And that's why we all want to go native. My property is now half native. It's, I'm really working at it because I have a lot of vegetation. Dan, I pay tribute to him every show I do. Um, I mean, a barber I know met Dan, my husband, many times. But, um, and he's the one who established our yard. Uh, and uh, I always pay tribute to him because it, it has been a wonderful treat to me also. But remember that the birds disp disperse the seeds. So the more native seeds that they're dispersing, the better it is for climate change, it's better for us. Uh, and of course, for wildlife, uh, a painted lady butterfly. Now this is on a black eyed Susie. And before I forget, don't ever pop your flowers that have um, the tops like that, because let them go to seed, because birds and other, and butterflies and, 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 and other insects, that's a caterpillar. Uh, the young man I was with, nothing, he had sharp eyes, and so I showed you the segments of its body, and that's what it looked like. Uh, and I have not been able to identify what, what if it's a moth, or a, um, a butterfly. I've not been able to find it, ID it. So if anybody knows, um, I've tried several times. And a silver spotted skipper, uh, one of our pollinators, by the way, because butterflies are pollinate too. Uh, when you have something in your yard, and you have, I have, a, uh, I have a firewood crate in my yard that I have plants around, um, you know, the birds, but this is one of the arrangements my son made. Uh, in his yard. Uh, he doesn't have the wagon wheel any longer, but it was really wonderful shelter and beautiful. Um, now that we're home more and, um, and we're looking, not just looking for things to do, but we are creating, we're doing a lot more with our yards. Um, I put in a couple different ideas. A place I like to go, and it was Lehman's Run, but I put this in because of the salvia. Salvia is deer resistant, by the way. It, it resists deer. And also hummingbirds love it. And also cathedral flowers. And Chris, I don't know if you have cathedral now, but um, hummingbirds are 
partial to cathedral flowers also. And uh, there's another picture of it. Uh, Lehman's Run, unfortunately, is closed. It was on um, Route 9 down in Oceanville, and I went there every year. They had 26 different kind of gardens. But that is salvia, uh, and as I said, hummingbirds, and other birds I saw on it like that. And of course, we have our wake, rock, our, our wake robin trillium, always pretty in our yards. And there's another fly for you. I, I think he is so cute. His name is Tachina, T-A-C-H-I-N-A. Uh, and he's another one of our pollinators. I've only seen him three or four different times, by the way. Another feature that we do on our properties, is, this again is my son did this, because some birds really like the sound of dripping water, especially warblers. But you can do a lot of different things with native plants around um, and around uh, the water. My granddaughter, Laura, on their front yard, because my son went crazy in front of their house, uh, they're, they're very close to um, the state forest, and you can see Joe Pye weed there, this iron weed. That is their front yard. They had the whole, it was really huge. And Laura, Laura is a healthcare um, hero down at Citizen Bank. Her photo is down there, and it's right at the field. So I got to, because she's a nurse down in Florida now, she's 22, and uh, and uh, she has her Phillies band on and her Eagles jacket. And the, the Phillies are associated with the hospital that she works at. So they took pictures. So she's one of the heroes. And that's her standing there with the great blue heron. But he had the, everything was native in the front of his house. And talking birds and butterflies, it was such a treat, the, his whole property. It really was. That's just one section of it. I, I, if Bruce, if I could stop you right there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are at the bottom of the hour, and so I wanted to create uh, just a little bit of space for anybody who might have any questions so far in this. I, I love the detailed observations that you're making here. You're, <laughs> you're an incredible naturalist, Ruth. Um, Thank you, Chris. That's is appreciate there, that. Are there any questions out there in the ether? And I'm going to kind of scan through anybody who is sharing their their video stream right now or can wants to put something in the chat i would recommend something in the chat right now if you've got any questions at all no i guess i'm just being obtrusive okay. uh, <laughs> sorry about that and uh, all right. please i will continue no, with your, right. I will, with your I will, flow all right i will continue so and i um, a meadow you, you do really do not need a large area because um, several people in my life have created, created a little meadow in there, even though their property is not real large. And uh, there are just wonderful plants. And there are birds that come, uh, which I will show. Water features is very, very popular now. There are a lot of plants and you get benefit from this. The more native plants that you um, put in your water features, you will get dragonflies, and dragonflies eat mosquitoes. <laughs> and, you know, we have that daytime mosquito now that's, uh, I don't know how it got here, but we have it in Montgomery County. It's not, it's not too nice. Uh, but keep that in mind if you're going to do a water feature. A garden near Friends of High School Park, it's a very small property. All, everything native in there. And just look at the scale and what really can be done. Uh, and there's just another photo of it. It really was quite beautiful. And as I said, it is not a big property at all, but she is quite a gardener that did that. And there's the darner and the white-tailed dragonflies. They are, by the way, partial. They, you will find more dragonflies at places that have more native plants, by the way. They'll be more numerous there. So that is, and if you want, we're getting into rocks, whether you have a natural rock wall, but uh, ferns, um, that is a um, tree, tree fern, uh, and greater celandine rather than the lesser celandine that's so invasive. There's a better picture. And a celandine will, um, I think it really likes water uh, today, but it's a beautiful plant. Compare cinnamon, there's cinnamon fern. And no matter where I go in the world, coming back to my cardinal and to have that, now that's one of our resident birds and it lives within five miles of where it is born. So cardinals are in my yard every day. 
I have them all year round and I have more of them in the winter. Uh, a tree, a willow tree, I lost mine and therefore I don't get some of the warblers I used to get. But willows have a lot of insects. Uh, they uh, draw a lot of insects. Cedar wax wings are partial to them. Um, the oriole, there's our Baltimore oriole female and there's our male. These birds are, by the way, on their way down to Central America. The red eye vireo. These are all birds that came to my um, to the willow tree, even though they don't go to feeders. Look at that blue headed area with his spectacles, those white spectacles. Blackburnian warbler, Maggie, we call her magnolia warbler, chestnut sided. Um, not singing now, but it does say, please to meet you, Miss Beecha. All right. And the American red star. Uh, so, and another, another species that comes are thrushes. And that's, that's why it's important, like the not the manicured yard. I have leaves around in some, you know, other yard debris. I make Ruth, Ruth, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Uh, there's some very good questions coming in on the chat now. And okay. uh, <laughs> most, uh, I think most contemporaneously, I don't know why that word just came to my head, but it did, um, is the question of what kind, what species of willow do you recommend people native plant willows. here? There's several, there's several native willow trees. So like a black willow, like a property. Salix nigra? Yeah, there, it's according to your property, you know, that really, mm -hmm. um, or that, but a native willow. And that is, it's just really, um, uh, and I'm sorry I lost mine, you know, but uh, it really did attract uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, even if, even an Eastern wood pea, which is a woodland bird, was calling from it pee wee one morning on the top of the willow tree, an eastern kingbird. Like my yard is not for any of those birds, but they did go to the willow. And we have another question, or uh, yes, we do have questions. Uh, in a in a more urban environment, and I'm thinking about inside city limits right now. Mm -hmm. uh, are there particular uh, nectar or? Uh, uh, are there particular flowers that you would recommend for urban conditions rather than suburban conditions or dense well, urban you conditions? Could, you could definitely have zinnias. You could definitely have coneflower. Um, I'm thinking because I lived in the city, um, what I had in my yard. Uh, you could have bloodroot, which is wonderful. Um, and um, uh, you could have asters. You could have goldenrod. Any of those. None of those are... Um, um, you know, overwhelming, and you could plant any of them. In fact, you could plant some of them in. You know, we have big, you know, big pots now that you can plant different things in if you're limited in space. All right, or even step it. You know, step your pots up so you create a whole area of the plants together. Should I move on? Sorry, there's one more comment coming through here, okay. <laughs> and it is uh, from Christopher Hawk. I had four female hummingbirds all summer until last week, and I know their nests are difficult to find, but I was curious if they like a certain type of tree to make their nests. I, I think they're partial to sycamores. I found more nests in sycamores than anything else, but they will get, be in other deciduous. I have never seen them in an evergreen. All right. And they've been on the migration for the last several right. weeks. So, so. Right. They're on, but they're still coming through. Do not take your hummingbird feeders down until November now, because you have hummingbirds that are further north, and we've had these storms, and, and um, they need the food. They're on their way down to Central America. And four, that's nice to have four hummingbirds during the summer, because they are so territorial, too. They must have been chasing one another. Uh, my son had a lot of feeders out. Um, so, uh, and yet, uh, and he, um, um, he, he got a lot, but he had a lot of space. So, um, anyway, keep the feeders up till November and, uh, the nests are found in deciduous. The best way to find a hummingbird nest is follow the bird carefully with binoculars. That's how I have found every nest and it'll, it'll land. And especially if it's in the same area every day, that nest is around there when it's nesting. And you have to be patient because it's real small. It's only a tiny little cup. And it's got green lichens. The first lichens of the spring, those, that turquoisey green, 
That's the lichens. Every one of its nests, uh, the out, the exterior of the nest has that, the lichens, and that helps you find it too. But follow the bird. Okay? Should I move? Yes. Uh, Chris right. noted we'll that make. his his nest was in crepe myrtle. Uh, we don't encourage crepe myrtle in this no. part of the world. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're ready to go back uh, okay. to full well, speed. Here's our, Thank you. Here's our hermit thrush. And I have to mention having berries because some birds, um, do, especially our winter, um, other birds during the summer, uh, but that's where, that's why I have the winter berry uh, and the service berry uh, and uh, birds for the berry uh, production. So they're two of my berry producing plants and hermit thrush will come for those as they're passing through. Hermit thrush sometimes hang around for the winter, but not in numbers. They're on the way South America too. And there's a, that's a cedar waxwing on a service berry. They're partial to that. Our American robin, the robin that nested um, in our yard is not going to be here in the winter time. We have our uh, robins that come down from Canada and our robins that nested here go down to Florida. So, uh, and puddles. There's, here we get to our water feature. When there's a puddle and this little bird uh, uh, was enjoying itself, I was only a few feet from it and here she is. <laughs> She was a parola warbler, uh, a, a female parola warbler. Birds love to bathe and they love fresh water. I make sure I put fresh water in my bird baths every day. They wait for me to do it. Uh, they really do. Some of the wildlife in my yard, I've already said the deer. I have um, rabbits, uh, the fox, here are the raccoon. There's the deer across the street. I counted as many as 15 one night. Chipmunk, I have two chipmunks. I only had one before, so and they're a fox. And I had to put the blue jay in because blue jays this year, I've never had them during nesting time. And there was one fledgling that was, oh my gosh, the most aggravating sound of, because the blue jay really is very aggressive, uh, especially with its sound and announcing it. And the parents were tired of feeding it. So it came to the feeder and it would yell. It would actually yell right in the parents' faces. And they would look at him like, oh, go away already. He was bigger than them. Uh, and there's a little blue jay that doesn't have its tail yet, not the one that was calling. So, uh, and a, a groundhog, may all your groundhogs be like this, and that is a uh, oven bird uh, next to the groundhog, and we're going to follow the oven bird. I want to show you where these birds go so you appreciate where, where do they go when they're not in our yards or they're not further north. So let's go a little south down to the rainforest. Like, let's try Trinidad. <laughs> no, this is on Tobago. Um, to be in the rainforest is wonderful. Just imagine you fly uh, four or 5,000 miles to get to the rainforest, and then you're around all different creatures, and your flowers might be queen of the night. By the way, this is the flower um, that's medicinal hallucinogens. If you would sniff that flower at night, you would definitely have hallucinations. All right, orchids, this is what our birds uh, that are here coming through our yards or nesting in our yards are exposed to. The hummingbird will be in the company of this white-throated mountain gem. Um, this umbrella plant is big enough for four of us to stand under it. Some of the vegetation in the forest is absolutely uh, gorgeous and huge. Resplendent Quetzal is one of the birds that are woodland birds and there's all the epiphytes. All their plants are different, everything's different. Um, chestnut mandible toucan, um, interesting bird. They are near volcanoes. That's the Aranal, that's um, Irizu volcano. This is the Aranal volcano and the gardens there. Uh, the streams, this is the Vegre, uh, where we would find some of our uh, birds, our water birds, and be in the company. Not raccoon or anything, the howler monkeys, they say. And this is one of their like wetland areas. Um, and the different vegetation our birds get used to. The butterflies, the postman butterfly, and the bees. I call this the bee bell. I have no idea what species, but I thought that was amazing how they built that. And uh, this, uh, this is a lizard. They, really, you find this lizard near, bird, near um, uh, bird feeders, by the way, underneath the bird feeders. It's a vegetarian. It won't hurt you. And to see our green heron or great blue heron, uh, at Caroni Swamp are in the company of Scarlet Ibis and our warblers are in the company of this little hooded warbler and now we're back at Pennypack, our beautiful Pennypack, our preserve 
And thank goodness to the trust, they started planning all those fields. What an unbelievable uh, adventure that was to plant these. There's the goldenrod and all the grasses. And if you have room, you know, to make a little meadow, uh, bobolinks, of course, I've seen there at the trust and a couple other places, Eastern Bluebird. And I saw this behavior the first time at Penny Pack, oh, it had to be 20 years ago, of they, there were 40 blue, Eastern Bluebirds and they were teaching their young one to go in and out of the house, which they're cavity nesters. And I've seen this behavior four times now. Um, and now here, see the young birds. Uh, and <coughs> excuse me, there were 12 Eastern Bluebirds that day. But here you put, put a meadow, you could attract an indigo bunting or else you have warblers. The palm warblers at Penny Pack in the fall are amazing in all of the fields, plus other birds. Bald eagle, and now maybe an immature, and here's an immature in flight, or now that hawks are flying through, so if you're strolling at the Penny Pack, you might see the red tail hawk, the red shoulder hawk, or the northern harrier over one of the fields. And there's the green heron that's going down to Central America, by the way, but it always stops at, uh, at Penny Pack. The great blue heron, I took, I love that picture of the heron. And I call this serenity because great egrets will stop there also. And the wood duck and the features for the water features. I just love this uh, back on the, um, the, the lower trail in the back part of Penny Pack. And go plant, think native. Think plan sale on Saturday from uh, 9 to 3, and uh, I understand the prices are very reasonable, and there's a wide variety, and I had to put a bumblebee in there, uh, and my favorite picture of the trust is this picture of early fall, and I wish, I hope that all of you enjoyed this. I enjoyed putting this together, and uh, it was great. Um, I didn't see everybody, but it was great being here. And I thank Chris for inviting me. And I'll be glad to answer any question. Boy, what a fabulous presentation, Ruth. Just wonderful. Chris, I had fun doing it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I see Gail smiling. All right. Uh, are there any questions or any comments? Uh, anything that you're experiencing? Um, you know, because there's no question that's, um, you know, kind of silly or anything like that, uh, but, uh, or anything that you want to share about any birds that you're seeing on the property or you're curious about? I know there's uh, two questions that showed up uh, early in the conversation. One, I think, is absolutely a perennial question. Uh, how do you keep squirrels out of bird feeders? Okay. Easy question. You have the, if you have your feeder on a shepherd pole, you want to put a slinky up your shepherd pole and tie it, you know, just put it right on the little screw for your baffle. You have a baffle. And it won't hurt the squirrels, and you will stop feeding them because the IRS will not let you claim them. And they cost a lot of money. And that's how you get, or you, or you buy a squirrel buster feeder. But that's it. I do not feed squirrels anymore. I have the baffle, all right, and um, and uh, I couldn't afford it <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so so I a baffle and a slinky, those two things a, together. A slinky, right. If you can get a metal slinky. By the way, the slinky was designed. Metal, okay. Yeah, met, well, metal, and now they come in plastic. Plastic works too, but if you can get a metal one, I don't know if they still make them in metal, all right. <laughs> Um, Nancy Lawrence asks, uh, are you saying that we shouldn't deadhead any flowers? Well, I, I do not. I find, I find, now, you know, the gardeners might think another thing. I don't do it. I don't do it. I just let them, because I, as you could see, that, that potted plant that I let, let it go, I, the birds were gone. I mean, that downy woodpecker, that plant, there was nothing left but all that, but there was food in there for him. It didn't look pretty, all right, but I know that gardeners have some other, um, you know, other ideas, and, you know, mine's always been about the birds, and that, you know, that's why some of my presentations are called Are You Artists for the Birds? Um, but I'm sure if she wants to do it, 
and I think that's fine. I just didn't ever top any of mine. I have a question for you, Ruth. Just this yeah. is myself here. Um, how is it that you are able to uh, to make all of these observations of the innuendo of the of the behaviors of each of these species, and particularly the interactions between adults and juveniles? Oh uh, well, I saw the blue jays feeding um, the blue jay, and it's the behavior. Uh, when a bird is constantly, especially at this time of the year when a bird is constantly calling, most likely that is a young bird. But this is a good question for another reason, Chris, because I wanted to say that young birds. And uh, what's happening because of climate change, some birds are having a later breeding. Like blue jays would have been over and not had a young one right now. And that's part of the issue too. The parents are ready to move on. Blue, jay, blue, 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 blue jays form a flock. For instance, cedar waxwings. And in, in right now in the fall, you don't see a mixed flock. You see a flock of adults or you'll see a flock of juveniles changing. They, the parents leave the birds. That's not what's happening in climate change now. Last year, I saw the youngest swamp sparrow I ever saw in September. And that's because the bird was delayed getting it to its nesting ground. It was migrating down. And that wasn't the only species, uh, all right? Some of the, um, uh, like some of the birds, like the Eastern Kingbird um, is, uh, that's one of the birds, the Black Birdie and I showed you. They're, they're two of the threatened species um, because where they, they both go by the, by the way, down the Amazon uh, basin. So they come back a long way to get further north than here. And by the time they're getting north, the, um, the trees have already greened out. So the insect population is not the quality of insects they would have had two or three weeks earlier. So that's how come those birds are. There's a lot of business like that going on uh, with, uh, you know, distribution is really, really different. Like for instance, red, um, red-breasted nuthatches are showing up already. This is kind of early because there's not bad winter. That's an indication that further north is going to be a bad winter because they only come down here. And they're down in numbers, by the way. Um, and a friend of mine told me the warblers are going through right now, so everybody should be looking at for them in their yards and everything. There was a question <clears throat> from Deborah about the robins that she's seeing right now. I believe Deborah lives in northeast Philadelphia. Um, are, are these robins resident robins that should be heading south already, or are we already so seeing our robins Canadian? Left. Yeah, our robins So we're left. seeing Canadian robins. Right. No, well, they're not Canadian robins. It's an American robin, it's just, and it's the same species. It's just different, the distribution, all right? Because a lot of birds move around. So it's called, it's um, an, um, a short distance, maybe, you know, um, not exactly a short distance, but that's another term to use for it. Uh, that they're not leaving the states, in other words. And um, no, these robins that are coming down are the ones coming from Canada. They're coming down. They're arriving. Um, I saw one robin, I think, two weeks ago. Um, and so I, I haven't seen any of the, I haven't had any of the robins in my yard. But I know when I'll get them because I love, robins must have been my first bird because my mom used to put me out in the coach when I was baby. We lived in the country. Because every year when I hear a flock of robins in the fall, I still get chills. So I think that that was my first bird. I haven't had my first flock yet, but they'll be down. And they'll stay all winter with us. And by March, they'll be gone further. And our robins will be back to nest. All right, we're not going to rush it. So I thank everybody for coming. Oh, there's one more picture. Okay, that's all right. Where is that pond in the picture? Chris, uh, Chris, how do you like that picture? Are you seeing it? I, I have seen that's that the pond. Wetland. That's your wetlands. That's my favorite picture of the trust. I absolutely love that. I love that area too. <laughs>I feel good and it's, um, it's nice to see some people I haven't seen for a long time. Uh, you're all looking good and be safe and be well everybody.